Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. I have a couple of topics, actually, within this one big topic. So much so that I practically need to rename the, the lecture itself. I've chosen to call it the challenges of finance for the U.S. and China. And you'll see how it splits into two、uh, pieces. And I want to say, actually, that there are ramifications for what's going on for us as,、uh, individually, as well as for us as a country. Now, I want to make clear also, I'm not talking about on an economic perspective. There are clear economic challenges we face, there are clear economic challenges that China faces. But I want to focus on financial challenges. This requires a bit of an explanation as to how that's different. Economic challenges are very macro, political even.、Okay. I'm not here to talk about those because that discussion will never end. I'd rather focus on things that we can do something about, those who affect us in the private sector. And I will conclude with some recommendations that I think would help us in this country, as well as those、uh, citizens、uh, of China. You'll see what I mean when I, I go to this. But anyway, what is finance? Even if you've, I, I, at the University of Maryland, even when I teach the subject to juniors and seniors, I frequently have to start by defining the subject. Finance is a cousin of economics, definitely. What, but specifically, it deals with one thing the world of finance. You can break it down to two camps those, it doesn't have to be people, those who have capital and those who desire capital. Stop there. The study of finance is the transmission of capital from those who have it to those who want it.、Okay. Everything else, corporate finance, investments, international finance, asset valuation, those are studies of what is needed in order for capital to transmit like this. It doesn't just flow there. And so, with this, we have to study those who do have capital in the current world as well as, as those who want it. Now, I want to make a cl clear distinction here. I should not use the terms that you have heard in macroeconomics, supply and demand. We can use supply, that's fine. Capital suppliers are those by virtue of having earned and saved more than they spend, have surplus. That's okay. But the other hand, we should not call demand. Why? Who doesn't demand capital? Bill Gates demands more capital. There's a different word that we should be using, which you don't hear. It's from the perspective of the capital suppliers. How would they view it? Why would they ever let their precious capital transmit to this side? It's not because they demand it, it's because they deserve it from the perspective of the suppliers. Hence, when we talk about investing, it is not charity, it is not a gift. From those who have capital to those who, uh, 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 who deserve it. It's because an investor requires a return. And hence, we should not use the term de、uh, a demand for capital. Deserve. Now, how they prove that they deserve capital, that discussion will never end, and it depends person to person. And it also is hard for some people to understand that frequently you could be in both camps at the same time. You probably don't believe me. Well, consider. Do you have a checking account? I'm sure you all say yes. What, what does that mean? It means you put your money as a demand deposit in a bank. You're a supplier. Do you have a mortgage? I believe most of you would say yes. That means you're in this camp at the same time. You deserved capital, your mortgage loan. And this is the case for people. As well as companies, as well as whole countries, how they are frequently in both camps at the same time. But without question, in the, in the、uh, world we know today, two countries are really at the extreme. Two countries. The one at one extreme is the United States. Let me come to them second. The one at the, uh, 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 who is at an, at an extreme, having moved from one extreme to the other in a short period of time, is where I'm going to start. And that is China. China, as you probably know, is the greatest creditor to the United States. They hold about $3 trillion of United States treasuries. Clearly, they are supplying capital. This wasn't always the case. A mere 30 some odd years ago, China was very poor. So poor, literally, could not feed their own people. Does everyone know what this is? It's the pot of a rice cooker. It's empty. 
An empty rice pot is a great metaphor for China 30 years ago. Couldn't have uh, 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 not enough food, but what did they do about it? Two things. One, they adopted capitalism. Now, I'm not here to discuss politically how you can reconcile capitalism with the communist politics. That discussion won't end. The other thing is that they continued to educate the people very, very well. What do you do when you have this mix? Well, it's very simple. The empty pot. You stir in the ingredients of wealth. Capitalism. 30 years pass, they are wealthy. (laughs) This is my metaphor. The China which was here is now here. And that is coming back to the United States in the form of this capital buying our treasuries. But this is not a perfect situation. You may think so. They have their own challenges. You may be surprised to know, though China is big here now, they are somewhat limited here. Now keep in mind, I did not say this is capital demand. This is capital deserve. And this is a big problem. How do you deserve capital in the capitalist world? You provide great returns on investment. You need an entrepreneurial class of people. When you have that, then you have a great financial situation, which is perfect transmission of capital from from what you have to what you deserve and can utilize. So for instance, we have not yet met that many uh, uh, people in China who uh, they're Bill Gates, they're Stephen Jobs, they're Jeff Bezos, they're Walt Disney. Now the influence of just one or two of these men, let's face it, they created whole industries. How much employment was made? And I'm not just talking about employment at their companies. How much related employment around the whole world, not just in the country, because of these entrepreneurs. And this is the kind of capital deserving that I'm talking about. The Chinese uh, uh, class, indeed, they're Chinese billionaires now, but they need to go further and push down the entrepreneurial thinking down to lower levels. Admittedly, having a Gates, a Buffett, uh, all all of our uh, billionaires, that's great, that's great. Even greater are those who aspire to it and who will never be that rich but are doing their own things. Now put them all together in a country and how much more good will come to a country that can do that. This is where China is now. In terms of education, you're probably aware how strong China is. If you are not, in 2012, the OECD released a study of educational uh, uh, standards around the world. I don't even want to talk about how the US did. Too depressing. In the top five, four of them were East Asian countries with Confucian roots, of which China, Shanghai in particular, was number one. Now, what have they done? They are often criticized for this, but they have instituted a very strong foundation of science, math, the bare basics. Have you heard the term STEM teaching? S-T-E-M, right? Science, technology, uh, uh, engineering, and mathematics. Very, very strong in many countries, uh, to be sure, in many countries. But where China has, what China has done is pushed it to such a level that they have been able to pull themselves up in such a short period of time. Again, capitalism by itself is of conduit, and that's great. But if you don't have the fuel through the conduit, you wouldn't have the results that they have had in these past 30 years. And this is the kind of fuel we need, intellectual fuel. China needs to do it slightly differently. They have the technical basis now with their strong STEM training. What they need is a little change in software. How do you in, in teach entrepreneurial capability? I'll be the first to tell you this is not a science. It, in, in, it involves parenting. It involves a, a environment. It certainly involves a change in mindset, risk-taking, if you will. Very true, very true. We have a lot of that in this country. We are a little weak on the foundations, and let me come back to that second. So the financial challenge before China is, obviously, they should continue what they've been doing with their earning, their saving, and therefore capital accumulation. That's great. 
But now they got to work on building up their deservedness, their capital deservedness. And I believe that is their new educational challenge. While keeping strong their foundation in basics, they got to somehow incorporate this. This will not be easy. It's not impossible, though. It's up to them to decide how, with their uh, 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 government funding and their uh, Ministry of Education, how they incorporate this. But this is their clear next step in their economic evolution. Now let's turn to the United States. We are not here. We are very much here. Fortunately, we do deserve a lot of capital from the perspective of those who have it. This might surprise you. Now, you, you talk about um, uh, the economic crisis we've been through, and frankly, it's not over yet. You may be surprised to know that go, looking around the world, we're doing relatively well. Now, I'm not going too far with this. We could be doing a lot better. This is nothing to be, uh, brag about. Fourth quarter of 2012, United States GDP, 0.1%. Nothing to brag about. However, among the rest of the developed world, only one other country had even a positive number. That happens to be Germany. The rest of the Eurozone, oh boy, oh boy. I don't want to talk about that. UK, Japan, let's special case China, because China is not really what you call a developed country yet. They are growing uh, 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 at a, what you might think is a high number, but off a still slowing basis. They were used to be growing 15%, 8% relatively speaking for them, is a bit of a slowdown, okay? Be that as it may, we are not doing that badly in case you are wondering why the S&P 500, for instance, is doing so well. Again, we're not doing that badly. And in the the whole world, everything is on a comparative basis. You cannot say we deserve and therefore we will get, and if you look short, you don't get anything. Well, the world just doesn't work that way. Do you deserve the capital more than anyone else? At this moment, the surprising and hard to believe answer is yes. The United States and our corporations are more deserving of the capital than so many others. Our challenge is actually sl- significantly less on this entrepreneurial framework. Again, I don't, I'm not the first, the, the best person, the sociologist can tell you how we got that way, but the society that could create uh, 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 Bill Gates, uh, 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 Michael Dell, uh, Jeff Bezos, the society that can do that is doing other things as well. The guys at Google, one of whom graduated from the University of Maryland. Magnificent, right? This is not just a comment on them, but mostly that, but on our society that we could create these capital deservers so that there is this ability to create wealth, create employment, create prosperity, frankly. So what are we missing? We're missing this. We're missing the supply of capital, our indigenous supply of capital. We are borrowing from around the world. I don't think that's going to end, but we got to do better. And I suggest that where China needs its educational effort more on the entrepreneurial side, we have that. We need it more on the technical side. STEM training is a great and absolutely critical part of uh, uh, this next, uh, uh, where we're pushing uh, the educational initiative. I completely agree with that. But we need something more when we talk about the financial challenges. And I'm going to illustrate it this way. Mathematically, as a professor of finance, I can tell you there's very little in undergraduate finance that actually requires difficult mathematics. Very little. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I'll illustrate this way. Suppose someone were to ask you if you invested $200 for two years at a 10% rate of interest. You would think this should not be difficult. A a financially literate society should be able to have most of its citizens be able to answer something like that. The answer happens to be $242. If you're not sure, $200 times 1.1 squared. Very simple. Fifth grade arithmetic. I know it's fifth grade arithmetic because my son happens to be in the fifth grade right now. I asked him to do it. He could do it. However, that makes him numerate at that level. It does not make him what I call financially numerate. 
does he know the context in which to place that formula? Does he know about compounded interest, time value of money? Does he, in fact, even know what a deposit is? Now, as my son, I'm going to teach him. But he's not getting it in school. And this is the approach that I think we need to make in the, as the next big step in the financial literacy movement. Last month, uh, the McGraw Hill Research Foundation published this paper of mine called The Challenge of Financial Numeracy because I want this to be a new step and a distinct step on the way to financial literacy. It is not a goal in itself. It is a necessary step on the way towards financial literacy. And this kind of teaching is what I suggest we need to do more individually for ourselves and importantly for our children. However successful the financial literacy movement is, we will not be able to catch every child. It's, it's, it's a multi-year process, clearly, before they go off to college. Okay. But you want, just like anything else, you want to do these things from a small base slowly over the course of time. In my opinion, starting them when they're learning numbers is not too fast, is not too early. First grade, well, while you're talking about your ones and twos, $1, $2. Not the focus, but start introducing these concepts. And why do I feel this way? I bring the analogy to like computer science. In computer science, when you, t uh, when you study at the university level, one of the things they tell you is, we're not here to teach you a programming language. The programming language is just a, a tool. Programming languages come and go. I, I myself learned Fortran in high school. Some of you never even heard of that one. Pascal, I worked in APL. You know, I doubt these even exist anymore. But what was the focus of the computer science curriculum at co in college? Thinking. How do you think? Do you know how to do structured programming? This is the key thing that they want you to get out of a, com of a computer science faculty. And this is where I think we should take our children. Again, from the perspective of someone who teaches this material, I know it's not too hard to teach at, for instance, the high school level. For instance, so many students uh, are ready for uh, a AP calculus, for instance. I assure you, if they could get a, a good grade on AP calculus, they are ready for uh, uh, undergraduate investments. They are. You need much less math in undergraduate investments than uh, uh, you need it in AP Calc. AP uh, uh, micro and macro, those courses now exist. If you're ready for that, you're ready for, uh, to learn about a, a college level finance. Again, why am I focused on this? Well, just like the computer science example, the thinking about finance is critical. Do they truly understand time value of money? I'll tell you, it sometimes takes even a, a, an undergraduate student a month or two before they fully understand the time value of money concept, which incorporates compounding forward and discounting backwards. But some people, frankly, never get it. But since it takes a, 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 perhaps a 20-year-old two months, well, why don't we start them earlier? It's not that hard to explain it in words. And when you start explaining in words and you start doing the mathematics, such as compounding $200 forward for two years at 10%, They'll learn about it eventually. And in so doing, they'll learn about the importance of saving, too. They'll learn about, and I know it's hard for them to even understand the concept of retirement. They'll at least hear the words. They'll learn about college savings. They'll learn about, uh, um, you don't want to go too far with stocks for children, but they'll learn about the corporate structure. Let's face it, they need to know something about this. It doesn't just arise, it doesn't just exist because someone did it, you, they, we, have a role in corporate America. And not just because you, you, this audience happens to work there, but if you uh, aspire to a pension and a comfortable retirement, you'd better know a lot about how stocks and corporate profitability relate. And this is what I'm terming financial numeracy. It's not just individual skills. That too, that too. But far more importantly, I want, uh, I want people to have a sense of how to think about finance. There are many financial literacy movements in this country. I detract from none of them. They're all doing something. However, most of them are uh, specific. 
specific issue, why you should save, why you should uh, invest in a, a college fund, why you should take care of your IRA, your 401k. All good, all good. Or one book wherein you teach them how to figure these things out for themselves. I will admit the challenge is big. The challenge, however, is not insurmountable. Did we not surmount crises in the past? Surely we did. I mean, I'm not just talking about financial challenges, but economic challenges of all types. We can do this. We can do this. Let's, and if you lose sight of the goals here, there's one thing that you have to remember. For your children and for your grandchildren's sake, do you want them to want do better than we did? Our subprime mortgage crisis, oh boy. This should never have happened, right? It will happen again in some form if we don't teach our children, the next generation, enough uh, uh, financial skills to avoid. Now you can't just say, don't let this happen to you. Because the next time around, it won't happen in exactly this way. You can be sure of that. But it'll happen in another way. And that is what financial literacy via financial numeracy is all about. Why am I so insistent on this? Well, again, I'm a parent too. But I care deeply about the uh, society that uh, they will grow into and some years from now, uh, 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 my grandchildren. (coughs) We I, I'm sure you agree with me, don't want them to have to face the economic challenge we just did over the past decade. Let's, not, let's, let's, let's just not uh, go there. Let's prevent it. And if we adopt this, I'm telling you, we're going somewhere good. We're bringing our country back to the road to prosperity. And I'll tell you, it isn't hard. It happens like magic. <laughs> okay. Thank you.